Let us all say amen. amen. What a joy and a privilege it is just to be here, and we thank God for each and every one of you, and thank God for the presence of His Holy Spirit. Thank God for right here, right now. It's my great joy and privilege to introduce our speaker, a man that I had the privilege of meeting earlier, and I'm looking forward to hearing from him. Our speaker is Greg Oliver. He's a graduate of Southeastern Bible College. He's been a worship leader for more than 15 years. For the past six years, he has been the executive director of Awaken, a ministry of recovery. And I think with all my heart that it's a subject that all of us are very much excited about, hearing about, uh, because I believe with all my heart, all of us at some point, many of us, have experimented, we have enjoyed, we have become enslaved, but thank God we've been emancipated and set free. Let's give a hand for Greg Oliver as he comes to share with us how to be free. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, as you can well imagine, there have been times when I have spoken and the topic went out ahead of time and there weren't very many people in the room. And so to have a room that's filled with ministry leaders is a great encouragement to my heart. So thank you for that. Um, just real quickly, a little bit about me so you can get to know me. Uh, John, thank you for, for that introduction. And, and he mentioned that for about 15 years I did serve in uh, church leadership as a worship and music pastor um, in churches in Louisiana and then right here in Birmingham. And actually that was what I was doing when the other part of my life, which was a part for a lot longer than vocational ministry, uh, was exposed. And that was my years long uh, addiction to porn and sex, which manifested in a whole lot of unwanted behavior. And so for about 25 to 27 years of my life, <clears throat> that was a struggle that I fought with in silence, not believing I could bring anybody into that struggle with me for fear of consequences, for fear of rejection uh, because of a, a great deal of shame that I carried. And then for the last almost 13 years, I have been sexually sober, walking in freedom, experiencing grace that for years I told people about and believed for them but not for myself. And uh, God is very good to bring beauty from ashes, as he talks about in Isaiah. And he's done that in my life and uh, in my wife Stacy's life. Uh, this January, we'll celebrate 30 years of marriage. Uh, 13 of them really, really great. Uh, the first 17, I served up a whole lot of uh, not so great stuff. But uh, in, in uh, God's grace, he gave her grace to choose to stay with me and to see uh, this thing through that God was doing in my heart. And so, just so that you know, <clears throat> a lot of the things that I share are coming out of my own experience, both as someone who's been a, a Christ follower since the age of six, who also struggled with unwanted and addictive sexual behavior, and was trying to navigate all that while being in vocational ministry. And uh, that's a lot. And as ministry leaders, some of you probably know to some degree what that's like as John alluded to in his introduction. And I'm not here to get a show of hands or to you know, try to manipulate any kind of big you know, revival or confession, but, but to say that what you do as ministry leaders, as pastors, ministers, um, is extraordinarily stressful a lot of the time. And it can also be extraordinarily lonely. And there can be um, unrealistic expectations on those who are in leadership, not only to be free from any struggles yourself, but to know exactly what to do in all of these situations when this stuff pops up. And that's asking a lot. And so what can we do to try to, <clears throat> to deal with both of those? Well, that's why I'm here, to share a little bit about what I've been through and what we do now. Uh, my wife and I uh, had a real desire that God would be glorified through the story that he was writing out of our brokenness, but also out of my restoration and my healing and my freedom, my recovery. But also, uh, it, that, that kind of evolved into uh, overlapping with my desire to return to ministry, which I thought at first was going to be returning to vocational ministry inside the church, doing what I used to do. And it kind of transitioned into a desire to walk with people who were going through similar struggles to what Stacy and I had walked through. And so that's why Awaken was born um, <clears throat> in the summer of 2015. And so we'll talk a little bit later about what Awaken does. 
But uh, I'm going to put some stuff up here, I think, now. There we go. So we are pastors and leaders, and what we want to do today is move towards a greater understanding of sexual brokenness and towards preparedness to, to pursue that with more gracious shepherding. We're called to shepherd people through all a variety of things that they're going through. And <clears throat> when I talk to ministry leaders, one of the things that I most consistently find or hear is they didn't really teach me how to do this in Bible college or seminary. Um, it's a lot different now than it was when I went through Bible college and seminary. Uh, I struggle to keep up with this. It seems to be overwhelming. That's what I hear a lot. And yet the expectation that as a pastor or ministry leader, <clears throat> you have all the answers doesn't really go down, even though the difficulty in uh, meeting that goal continues to go up. And so if we can help you feel encouraged today, then we will have done our job. Um, one of the things that Awaken exists to do is to provide help for people who are coming out or seeking to come out of sexual brokenness. But just as much as that, we want to come alongside churches and ministries to help improve understanding and shepherding of people who are going through that. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So let's just talk a little bit about the problem. By the way, I could talk, and I'm not going to, but I could talk for hours, hours about this because of of, you know, it's just been a big part of my life, first as a consumer and now as somebody who is uh, trying to learn more about it to help other people find freedom. But we're not going to be able to do much more than scratch the very tip of the edge of the point of the surface because this is a problem that is deep and it's wide. And I know that you know that. Um, but just to give you some context as to how much this is infiltrating the churches of Jesus Christ, um, this is some research that was done. Uh, about 12 years ago, and so it's even dated now, uh, when we talk about how many people, men and women, who are seeking out porn at least once a month. So among men ages 18 to 20, this survey showed that 79% of them said that they use porn at least once a month. 67% uh, of men ages 31 to 49 use it once a month, and right about half, 49% of men 50 and older use pornography at least once a month. Now. Whether you would call once a month usage of pornography addictive or compulsive, that's probably up for debate. But as Christians, we would say that's not something that we want to be okay with, right? And so using porn once a month may not be as much as some other people use it, but it's still regular porn use. But what about people who use it more compulsively? Well, before we get to that, actually, we want to show the stats for women. Because for years, for decades, porn has been thought of as a man's problem, right? That's something that men struggle with. In fact, I heard a lady speak one time who has um, a lot of, uh, she has a ministry and a whole organization that's based on helping women find freedom. She went to her pastor years ago and said, I am addicted to pornography and masturbation. And he said, sweetheart, women don't get addicted to that. You're wrong. She's telling him that she's addicted and he's saying it's impossible because in my filter that just doesn't happen. Well, the reasons are multiple because porn historically has been something that's been produced to appeal more to men and their visual stimulation than women. But porn is adopting and adapting new strategies because they know that they're missing out on half, half of the, the population. And so look at these numbers right here. Um, this is significant. Females ages 18 to 30, you see the difference between how many of them and how many men use porn once a month? It's almost not different at all. Among 31 to 49, it's only 16%, and women age 50 and over, it's 4 But look at what happens over one generation. When you go from 16% of 31 to 49 to 76% of women ages 18 to 30. So what do you think happened in that one generation? The Internet, right? The Internet, availability. And along with that, every time something new is invented, there's opportunity for good and there's opportunity for evil, right? Can we agree with that? Has the internet been used f of, of God to do great things? I mean, the internet's being used right now. There's some people who are watching this on a live stream. Hello, we're glad that you're here. So technology can be used for amazing, God-honoring things, but everything that is created for good can be distorted by our enemy and is. And the same is true for technology. And knowing that women are susceptible to the same things that men are, 
maybe with a little bit of a different approach, that's where we started seeing a change in what our culture is presenting as entertainment for women. You see things like Fifty Shades of Grey, Magic Mike, things that aren't hardcore pornography, but sort of you know, open the door and escort people in. And then once, uh, once women begin to, to consume porn, the same things that happen to hijack men's brains happen in women's brains too, and we can get chemically hooked. And so that's really concerning because in one generation, the gap between genders is all but closed. So what about people who use it several times a week? This is something that we would call a compulsive struggle, right? If you're using porn several times a week, it's a significant problem and you probably know it. So among men, you've got about 63% of the younger demographic, about 38% of 31 to 49, and about a quarter of men who are 50 and older. Thankfully, the numbers did go down, right? But they didn't go down all that much. You've got a lot of people approaching a majority of men in our society who are still using pornography compulsively. And when you look at the women, you see that the numbers are much, much lower, but you still have over a 400% jump in that one generation, from 5% to 21% of women who are using porn compulsively. So the problem is not getting better because the opportunity is still out there. You've probably seen some things uh, in the news about some of the, the, the highest level distributors like Pornhub and, and some sites like that getting some, thankfully, some well-deserved negative publicity because of the content that they allow on there. But it is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry and they're not going to go down easily. So this is something that's going to continue, as long as it continues to be available, people in our churches are going to continue to struggle. And the thing about it is, the more we look at porn, the more it changes what we think about different things, the less wrong we think it is, because it has a conditioning effect the more you utilize something. So I won't spend a lot of time here, but just want to kind of show you some of the things that have been researched. And a lot of this was Barna research that was done for an event that Josh McDowell put on about five years ago called the Set Free Summit. Um, so looking at uh, the concept of porn depicting children under 12 is wrong. They ask people, and among people who use porn daily, weekly, or monthly by their own admission, yes, I think that's wrong. So 90% of people who use it daily think that that's wrong, which means that 10% don't. 94 weekly, 97 monthly. So the, the, the more you use porn, the less wrong you think that behavior is. Well, what about porn depicting non-consensual sex acts? Again, the more you use it, the less wrong you think it is. Porn depicting teenagers in sex acts. You'll notice that weekly and daily, less than half of users think that that's wrong. In fact, teenage is a, is a key, significant keyword among porn producers because a lot of people want to see that youth either because they want to bring back their own feelings of youth or because it's taboo, a number of reasons. Porn depicting forced or painful sex acts. Less than a majority of all of the groups think that that's wrong. Porn that depicts demeaning a person significantly drops down. So the more we use it, the more cloudy our judgment as to what's right or wrong or appropriate or inappropriate becomes. So are we assuming that that's only the people that are in our pews and our seats? Because it's not. But before I get to, to ministry leaders, one of the things I think it's important to note is a lot of the research that's done in society in general shows these are the numbers of people who are consumers of pornography. But then when you look at a lot of the research among people who profess to be uh, fundamental evangelical Christians, the numbers are basically indiscernible from one another. There's not a significant decrease among people who identify with Christ and how much they use porn versus those who don't identify with Christ. But one thing that I found particularly interesting, when you take the people who identify as Christians and break it down into their uh, religious traditions, someone who identifies as a, a hyper-conservative fundamental denominational background is 90% more likely to use porn than a non-Christian. So let me say that again. If you identify as a member of a hyper-conservative, strict, fundamental denomination, you are actually much more likely to use porn than somebody who doesn't identify as a believer at all. Anybody think of a reason why that might be? Too much pressure. Too much stress. Nowhere to go to be anything but perfect. 
right? Where do we go when the halo's got some tarnish on it? We can't go to our leaders because they'll bury us under the church. At least that's what we believe. And so we, as leaders, it, it falls on us to examine the message that we have when it comes to the, uh, this issue and to ask, is this the message that the Holy Spirit would lead us to give to our people? Now, some of us have a hard time doing it because some of us, if you're like me, you were trying to do ministry while drowning and trying to just keep your head above water, struggling with this yourself. Now, some of the same Barna research shows that one in seven senior pastors admit to currently having a struggle with pornography. One in seven current users. And so if you look at this, you've got 14% um, who say it's a current struggle. Uh, there we go. 43% uh, say they've struggled with it in the past, and about 43% say that they have not struggled. So 57% of pastors uh, will admit that they've got a history with pornography. Now, one thing that I also have learned is whenever there are blind internet surveys, you don't get a 100% honesty rate on those. Because one of the things that goes along with problematic uh, internet use and, uh, and use of porn is there's an increase in paranoia of getting caught. And sometimes you think, well, these blind surveys aren't so blind. So you can probably bump those numbers up a little bit. I couldn't tell you how much. But anecdotally, I would say it's probably even higher than that. Now, of the ones who use porn, of those who use porn, there are 16% of them who are using it multiple times per week. So of those one in seven, 16% of them are pretty compulsive with their use. Um, you've got about 35% who use it a few times a month. You've got 26 every few months and 21 less often than that. So the experience kind of runs the gamut. Now, of those one in seven who are currently using pornography with some regularity, the percentage of those who believe that they may be addicted, a third of them believe that they are. 26% believe that they might be, which means that only 41% of pastors who use porn are pretty confident that it's not an addictive struggle for them. So 59% of pastors who are using porn are so neck deep in it that they think, this is probably something I'm addicted to. And who can they talk to, right? Who knows about your porn use? This is another part of the research. About 58% said that their spouse knew, not always voluntary. A lot of people get caught by their spouses while using. But think about that right there. Think about if you're a pastor and the only other person who knows about your porn use is A, the person who is most hurt and affected by it, and B, the person who would be most hurt and affected by you losing your job. That's a lot of stress on a relationship and on two individuals, isn't it? I'm not saying it's good to hide it from your wife, by the way. I'm just saying it creates a lot of stress. About 54% say they have at least one or two trusted friends who know about it. 30% say that other pastors know. 10% say that a few people in their congregation know about it. Only 8% say that any elders or deacons in their church know about it. And less than 1% would say that most people in the congregation would be aware that this is a struggle for them. Those last three are pretty concerning, aren't they? Now, as a pastor, do we need to air out all of our dirty laundry to every single person in the church? Is that smart? Is that safe? No. Do you think it's important that the people in your congregation know that you don't belong on a pedestal? Somebody told me the only thing pedestals are good for is falling off of, right? But a lot of times the pedestalization of our leaders happens. And sometimes it's because we present ourselves in such a way as to encourage it. And sometimes it just happens. Like, I don't want to be set up as this model for perfection because I'm not perfect. But the culture exists where I believe now that I'm expected to be perfect. And God help me if I ever struggle with some of the stuff that you, you guys are struggling with. Because most people in ministry believe that if they struggle with porn or sexual sin, that if that were exposed or confessed, that they would lose their jobs. And most of them are right. And there are some cases in which that's absolutely appropriate. But is it absolutely appropriate in every case? I think these are important questions to ask ourselves. But when we get to the point where some of the people who matter the most, those who we're supposed to be submitting to their authority, don't know, 92% of them don't know, then that's, that's a problem. 
Most people, whether they are congregants or leaders, don't believe that they have any, anybody to help them. Looking at this here, is anybody helping you avoid porn? So among uh, teens and young adults, 79% don't have anybody helping them. Do you have anybody who could help? Well, 47% of them say yes, 20% say maybe. Only a third say that they absolutely don't have anybody who could help. So there's a big gap between asking for it and getting it because it's a big step to ask for help for something like this. Well, what about over 25? You got 87% who don't believe they have anyone who can help them. And you've got almost half who absolutely believe that there is no one who could help them. The longer we're in this, the deeper the problem becomes, the more it becomes infiltrated in our lives. The more trapped we feel, the deeper we fall into shame, and the less we believe we have any other option. That's where I lived. I believed for a long time before I got caught that I was addicted. And I knew that the only way to break an addiction was for somebody else to know. Therefore, I'm not gonna get out of this addiction because nobody can know. That would destroy my life, it would destroy my livelihood, it would ruin everything, and I can't let that happen, was the narrative, as if I had control over that. And God graciously, in his love for me, which was, it felt pretty harsh at the time, but it was actually the most gracious, loving thing he could have done on January the 6th, 2009, blew it up and brought it out into the open so that I could have some consequences but ultimately experience freedom. But most people who are deep in this don't believe that there's anybody who can help. And that's really sad, but it's the reality. So how did we get here? How do we get to the point where pornography became so prevalent, sexual sin became something that is absolutely just infiltrating like a pandemic, which is language that we now understand a lot more over the last couple of years in the church? Well, I want to show you something that a British researcher named Paula Hall um, came up with. This is called the OAT model or the OAT model. So the circle up there represents opportunity. Okay? For people who become addicted to pornography, Everybody has opportunity, right? You can't become addicted to something that you don't have access to. That's pretty obvious, right? So that includes 100% of everybody. So if you have ever used porn, you had the opportunity to use porn, and therefore you have the opportunity to become addicted to porn because there are biological chemical hooks that can be hijacked if you use it a lot more. Well, what causes some people to use it a lot more and other people to seemingly be able to use it more peripherally or more casually? Well, if you overlay another experience, which we will call people who have issues with attachment. Now, by the way, I'm not going to get into a long psychological presentation here, but most of the research is showing that people who become addicted to anything, whether it's alcohol, drugs, sex, food, gambling, shopping, any compulsive process or substance, have these experiences in our lives that have contributed to them. And that's significant enough to where we can't ignore it. As leaders, we can't say, just make better choices. Trust me, by the time somebody is sitting in your office asking for help, they've tried making better choices. They wouldn't be in your office if they thought they had any way out of it that didn't involve having to let somebody know. So lest we think that it's as simple as love Jesus more than your sin, they would love to experience loving Jesus more than their sin. They probably do love Jesus more than their sin. They probably hate what they're doing, but they're trapped because they've had these experiences that they've never, never figured out how to process healthily. And they've got opportunity overlaid with attachment issues where the home in which they grew up, they had some failure to get secure attachment. And if you know what I'm talking about with secure attachment, it's not about blaming our parents. It's just about acknowledging the way that things were. Some of our parents were given the best they could based on what they had been given, but it wasn't enough. So we have to acknowledge that there are attachment struggles that a lot of people have. And when you overlay that over opportunity, the people who have experienced that have a greater probability of becoming compulsively uh, hooked. Then you take another a aspect, which is trauma. Okay? Trauma is not necessarily family driven. It can be event driven. It can be culturally driven. It could, be, uh, it could be abuse, neglect. It could be someone who had great parents, but they had a friend of the family who sexually molested them from the time they were six years old until they were 16, and nobody ever knew. It could be the cultural trauma of growing up African-American in a place where African-Americans are not given opportunities or not given understanding or have a more difficult time experiencing life than white, than white Americans do. 
That can be cultural trauma that white people cannot understand. If you haven't been through it, you can't understand it. It could be, uh, it, it, all, all, it could be a shock-based trauma. It could be uh, seeing someone that you love killed in an accident. There's all types of trauma. When you take opportunity, attachment, and trauma, and you overlay those, you see that space in the middle. People who have gone through all of the above tend to have a greater possibility of using pornography to escape, to numb, or to medicate pain. Now, we think you use pornography to be stimulated. Use pornography because it turns you on and you love it. A lot of times that may be what cracked the door, but now we find that that behavior numbs out all of the things that I carry with me throughout the day. And while I'm doing that, I can drown that out and I can forget about it. The problem is when I'm finished using, all of that stuff is still there. And now it comes back even deeper than before because I've got this huge element of shame. What is wrong with me? What kind of Christian am I? Am I even a Christian? Because somebody who really loves Jesus wouldn't do this stuff, right? So there's the problem, the dilemma that we find ourselves in. So, if we want to bring this brokenness into the light, when we say we want that happening, do we want our people who struggle to be able to ask for help and get it? Yes, we sure do. So what are most ministry leaders saying about porn and sexual brokenness? There's nothing else on that slide. That's the answer. <laughs> and that's the problem. Because most of us don't know what to say. Now, I would guess that the ratio is probably different among the men who are in this room because you came to something like this. Right? This is probably somewhat of an example of preaching to the choir. If you're sitting in a room voluntarily when you knew that the guy talking was going to be talking about porn and sex, then you may not be someone who is content to say nothing. You probably aren't content to say nothing. But historically, our churches have been fairly silent on this. Would you agree with that? And when we haven't been silent, we've been somewhat harsh. Would we agree with that? And somewhat simplistic in the answers and the solutions that we offer. And what I'm saying, as humbly as I can, is that's not good enough. We have to do better. Jay Stringer, is uh, an ordained minister and a psychotherapist who trained with Dan Allender at the Allender Center uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And he wrote a brilliant book, came out in 2018, called Unwanted, How Sexual Brokenness Reveals Our Way to Healing. He did research that involved over 4,000 clients, his and other therapist clients. And what he started doing is he started asking questions about the type of unwanted sexual behavior that people get caught up in and overlaying that against their early childhood and developmental experiences. And he found there was a lot of commonality between if you had this happen to you, this is often a way that you're going to end up acting out. If you use this kind of porn, it's probably, it's very likely that this was a part of your experience growing up. And so rather than every time the subject of lust comes up going, la, 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 not going to talk about it, he encourages us to listen to our lust because it has something to tell us to dive down and explore the origin story of the struggle. Boy, that seems scary, doesn't it? It seems like just, uh, just nurturing it. It seems like indulging in it, which is why we do it with help from a safe distance. But we can't, we can't own something that we don't understand. And so as leaders, part of our job is to get people the understanding and the help that they need and not to have a message that's going to propagate the shame. This is a quote from uh, Jay's book. He says, while many religious leaders have recommended prayer, scripture reading, and other spiritual practices to overcome sexual temptation, very few have encouraged their faith communities to explore the traumas beneath their struggles. Even fewer have recognized the ways their strategies collude with sexual shame. Now that sounds harsh. We're talking about the difference between intent and impact. What do I mean by that? Have you ever done something that you had a certain intention, but it had a very different impact? Does that mean that the impact didn't happen or that you don't have to own that just because you had a better intention than that? Right. What do we want for our people? Do we want holiness for our people? Yes, we do. Is it possible that sometimes in that desire to stir them on and prompt holiness in their lives that maybe we, we have unintentionally prompted their shame? in a way that they're, they're not going to be able to hear what we're really trying to say to them. 
So that's how we collude with sexual shame. Few people receive comprehensive sex education, and most sex education, when it does take place, focuses on what to avoid. Try learning how to cook if the only thing you ever learned about was food poisoning. I think that's one of the best quotes in the book. The result of our cultural sexual silence is that the door is wide open for porn to be the most prominent sex educator of our day. Guess how embarrassed pornography is to answer anybody's question? Not at all. When our kids are curious about sex, when I was curious, I'm 51 years old, when I was curious about sex, you know what I did? I got the World Book Encyclopedia S, turned to sex and to see what I could figure out. Or I would look for magazine articles, or I would ask my friends, which I don't know why I did that, because they were just as dumb as I was. But I would, but now, nobody has to ask anybody, because you've got countless hours, you've got lifetimes of bad information available at your fingertips. You know that on Pornhub, the amount of content that was uploaded to Pornhub in the year 2019 was long enough to where if you watched all of that one year's only worth of original content, you would have to go back to 1865 and start watching it all the way up to 2019. 154 years worth of content uploaded in one year. So there's, it's never exhausted. You can never run out of new things to see, and porn is never embarrassed to give bad answers to every question. We have to do better. We have to be unashamed to engage in these conversations. Last part of the quote, when a religious community practices shaming, the eradication of desire and silence, it colludes with the effects of sexual shame and trauma. And I don't think we want to do that. I don't think we want to do that. There's a video that I saw um, on YouTube, and it was by a very prominent pastor and ministry leader, and every one of you knows who it is. I have deep and long-standing respect for most of what he has shared, and so I'm not going to mention him by name, because I think he really missed it on this one. It's a clip, and it's the basic premise of it is, you are not addicted to pornography. And in about five minutes, he makes an argument out of a severe lack of understanding as to what addiction is, and he suggests that if there's ever a time that you could say no, then that means you're not addicted. That's not what an addict is. An addict is someone who is eventually always going to act out, but they can be functional for a long time. And when we have ministry leaders who, with good intentions of not soft-selling holiness, make harmful statements like that, what if you're the one who has been desperately and deeply trying to find freedom and you've got somebody that you respect and you've read saying, you're not addicted, you just don't love holiness enough. It can be really, really damaging. So we want to make sure first that we're not doing more damage, but second we want to make sure after we're not a part of the problem, we've got to be a part of the solution. So how does a church become a safe place? How do we create a culture that encourages authenticity? Well, first off, it's going to be a real pain if you want to do that. If you're going to open that floodgate and ask people to be real about their struggles, get ready. Because if they start to trust that you really mean it and they start to come, that's going to create some work. But guys, let me tell you, it's work worth doing. It is so worth doing. And you don't have to do it all alone. So first off, recognize that sexual sin is the same as any other sin. Okay? Listen to the messages that we hear preached about pornography and sexual sin. A lot of times... We will rank sin, maybe not saying those words, but the way that we talk about it, and even ranking sexual sins. You know, we'll, we'll talk about premarital sex in one way. We'll talk about pornography in one way. We'll talk about homosexuality in a whole different way, as if there are rankings of ones that in God's eyes are better or worse than others. And yet James tells us that if you kept the entire law and broke it in one area, it's as if you've broken the whole law. So that kind of falls by the wayside. There's no sin that's worse than others. But we also have to recognize that sexual struggles are different. It's the same and it's different. What do I mean by that? I'm not trying to be confusing. Sexual sin is more widespread within most churches than many other sins. That's how it's different. 
I don't know if any of y'all remember a movie from about 25 years ago called Outbreak, and it had Dustin Hoffman and Morgan Freeman in it. It was about a viral outbreak of Ebola, and it hit this town in California where about 60, 70% of the people in that town got this virus. Well, what did they do? They shut down the whole town, and they descended all of the military and the medical personnel because they knew that if something is killing 70% of our people, we got to forget about everything else. We're not talking about property taxes right now. We're not talking about you know, any, any other concerns that this city has because our people are dying. And in the church, sexual brokenness is affecting people in greater numbers than many other areas of sin. And we have to act like that by not having a message that makes it seem like it's this much of a problem when it's this much of a problem. And so that's what I mean by it's different. It's the same, which means we normalize in our discussion to minimize shame, but we increase the amount that we talk about it because that's what our people are struggling with. We've got to create a culture and a dialogue where sex is discussed positively and unashamed as the gift of God that it is. That includes helping to train parents on how to sexually disciple their children throughout their lives. It's not the talk. It's an ongoing conversation. And when does it start? Well, it starts in age-appropriate ways as, as soon as they're old enough to understand the difference in gender. Now, you're not talking about sexual intercourse to a toddler, but you can talk about the difference in body parts. And then you evolve the conversation as they get to be four and five. And then you evolve it more as they become seven and eight so that by the time they hit puberty, if they have a question, guess who is the authority in their life? You are, as their parents. And they're going to bring their questions to you. Okay, but it involves work. And as church leaders, we've got to encourage and, and um, just offer a lot of opportunities for parents to get some help with that because most people who are becoming parents right now didn't probably have that from our parents, from their parents. Because it's hard to pass on what you didn't possess yourself. Another thing that we've got to do is to create a Me Too culture where honesty and confession of sin start at the leadership level. That can be scary. Right? Especially if you feel like your folks have got you on a pedestal. But what would it look like to refer to your sin in a sermon and not always use a hypothetical past tense? Yeah, I've had struggles in the past. Well, please tell me what they are. I want to know that you understand. So many times we fear that if there's any specificity to our struggles that we would lose respect in the eyes of our congregation. And usually the opposite is true. Usually, when they see vulnerability, that's going to draw them because they're going to think, this guy understands, this guy gets it, and maybe I would be safe talking. It can be risky, and again, I'm not asking you to air all your dirty laundry to your congregation, but somebody needs to know your whole story. If there are things that you struggle with, somebody needs to know. And the congregation needs to know that they don't have a shiny, perfect person that they can never live up to. So we've got to create a Me Too. Everybody has a lot easier time going second than going first. So let's give them the chance to go second. Finally, uh, I think there's two more. Build relationships with therapists, ministry specialists, and other churches. Pastors and church leaders, you do not need to try and address all of these things by yourself. How many of you feel like you've got sufficient training to fully understand the intricacies of sexual addiction and how it affects a person in their marriage? This is all I've been doing for six years, and I didn't raise my hand either. Okay, How many times have well-intentioned pastors had a couple in their office who she caught him looking at porn, he's been doing it for years, she doesn't feel safe engaging in sexual intimacy with him, he's complaining, and we're like, oh, 1 Corinthians 7? I mean, that's the only one I can think of. Well, maybe if you had sex with him more, and we're just re-traumatizing a traumatized woman by not fully understanding what's going on. And even in that passage, not understanding that the thing that says before that is that the husband's body belongs to his wife. So who's breaking that command first? It's very complicated. We need to find people that we trust that are not going to supersede or undermine the spiritual authority that Jesus Christ has put in his church leaders, but are going to give consistent help with that. And they are out there. I promise you that they are. We are. Finally, be prepared to offer real solutions for people who ask for help or people who are exposed. It's going to come out one way or another. Either people are going to get caught or they're going to raise their hand. And when they do, we've got to be prepared. So as we start to land the plane here, I want to tell you some of the ways that Awaken has solutions that you need to know about as a ministry leader. Some of these things you can send your people 
some of these things you can I implement in your own congregations. And when we take a team approach, we give better care to our people. Remember, you don't have to do it all yourself. Jethro knew that about his son-in-law, didn't he? He came and he said, you're trying to do everything and this is not good. You need to delegate. Okay? By delegating, was Moses a worse leader or was he a better leader? Better leader because he didn't try to do everything himself and do it half as good. So some of the things that Awaken offers, we offer weekly recovery support groups. Now these are groups that are gospel-based and 12-step focused. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which came out in the, in the mid-1930s, I don't know how much familiarity you have with AA or the Big Book or the 12 Steps. Those 12 Steps are dripping with the scriptural principles. These were men who read their Bibles, and they're a set of disciplines that in a recovery context are going to be encouraging surrender, change, what we call sanctification as it relates to this one thing. So we have a 12-step, Christ-centered approach. Jesus is our higher power. People are welcome at our groups, whether he's their higher power or not. But we talk about Jesus in our groups. And we offer it for men with unwanted sexual behavior, for women who are the partners, uh, the spouses of men who struggle, and for women who struggle themselves. We've got in-person groups, and we've got virtual groups. So no matter where you live or what your schedule is, we try to have an option that would work. I'm going to give you contact info on how you can find out more about all these here at the end. Um, my wife and I are both certified coaches. We have done extended training on for myself and sexual recovery, and Stacy has a, a life coaching certificate. We will work with couples sometimes in conjunction with their therapist. Sometimes we'll see them and help them process in between. Sometimes we'll work with people at certain points in their process, and that's available as well. We have intensives called the Roots Retreat. These are weekend intensives and workshops. Uh, one is for men who are struggling. One is for women who are partners. And what they do is they help to take, especially for the men, the amount of therapy that you would get over several months going once a week for an hour at a time in a weekend. It's hugely catalytic to help them connect some of the dots as to how their previous experience has affected their present and what to do about it next. The women's workshop is shorter, it's more informative, and we offer those several times a year. And then finally, this is something new that Awaken is just about to launch called Ministry Cohorts. One of the things that we've really struggled with over six years and have found mostly lack of success is in getting an entire church to say, yes, come on in and train our people, let's do this, let's change our whole culture. Because this is what we're talking about. To address this, in my opinion, adequately is going to require culture change in your church. And that's a hard sell. But what if there is one leader, one staff person, one elder or deacon, one men's or women's ministry leader who felt passionately about this, who could join with six or seven other people, form a cohort, and meet over the course of a year to learn this, to get this equipping, and then take it back into your church and spread it from there. We think that that's a much more feasible approach. And so starting in January, we're going to be launching our first ministry cohort. And we'd love for any of y'all who are interested to be a part of it. So just to sum up, for groups, just go to our website, awakenrecovery.com slash groups. And that gives you info on how you can connect or how your people that need to be at those groups can connect. By the way, those groups are confidential, anonymous. Um, what is said in the group stays in the group. We have ministry leaders who have come to our groups. And nobody says anything about it because that's not the role of the group. And so people who struggle, who th they're, very, they're people who are in uh, medical or professional or ministry positions that if this came out, they would lose their jobs. They still need a place where they can go. And these groups are those places. Uh, for coaching, it's slash coaching. For the Roots Retreats, it's slash Roots Retreat for the men, slash Roots Retreat women for the spouses uh, workshop. For cohorts, it's slash cohorts. So uh, all of those things are available from our website, and I'm going to leave that up um, for anybody who uh, needs some time to take it down. That's what I've prepared to bring to you guys. There's hours and hours more that we could talk about, but I want to leave a few minutes um, just for any questions. Has any of this prompted any questions or any particular situations you've been in where, you know, what do you do in a time like that? I should have kind of prompted it earlier to give you some time to think about it. But uh, I'll just open it up for a few minutes, and it's okay if it's quiet for a second, but if anybody has a question, I would love to be available to take that. I'll tell you what, I'm going to let uh, our live stream audience go. 
Thank you, live streamers. It's an honor to have you guys watching online, and we appreciate that. And this resource is available to you. Greg is here, Awakens here in our facility, so we're, we're honored to have you as a partner. So thank you. So thank you, Chris. Goodbye, everyone online. So that way, those of you here can.